And when you do the checklist every time, you know that when I'm taken off the runway, everything has been done right. And so thinking about that mindset of what the checklist accomplishes, um, we're, we're able to apply this to, to the pig industry. I'm confident we can apply it anywhere that we deal with, as, as uh, a tool mentions in the, uh, in the book, the problem of extreme complexity, where there are many things happening at a certain time, many inputs, many outputs, many processes and systems in the, in, in the mix, which I think describes a pig bar. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Swine It Podcast Canada. My name is John Patience, and I'm delighted to be the host for this session. And I'm even more delighted to have our guest today, Dr. Cordell Young, who is a veterinarian who practices in uh, swine medicine and is located in Lethbridge, Alberta. Cordell has a really, really interesting topic for us today. Uh, and also a very interesting story on how it came up. He's going to talk to us about checklists and their application in spine medicine, in the industry with producers. And he's going to give us some background on that and how he's applied that with his, his clientele. So, um, Cordell, uh, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Great. And, uh, maybe you could start out, not everybody will know you that's listening to this podcast. Cause remember we go way beyond the boundaries of Canada. <laughs> so please give us a, uh, give us a, a bit of background of yourself and, um, uh, your, your origins, how you came to be a veterinarian, how you came to be in Lethbridge and the kind of things that you're focusing on that you find that you've got the greatest passion for and, uh, and just allow the audience or the listeners to learn more about you before we get into the meat of the podcast. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, I uh, was born and raised actually on a mixed animal farm in uh, eastern Saskatchewan. And uh, I got introduced to animal agriculture at the age of eight or nine, I guess, when I was, uh, when I bought my first sheep. Um, Mom wondered why. And I told her I needed to pay for college somehow. In retrospect, I should have chose something other than sheep, um, but uh, that led me on a journey, I guess, to learning about sheep medicine and trying to keep sheep alive, which we all know is absolutely impossible. Um, and that eventually took me actually to the career path of, of becoming a veterinarian, and, and I did uh, two years of animal science before getting into the vet college there at the WCVM in uh, 2013, so... Um, I graduated then 2017 and had a job, uh, working exclusively in swine, uh, or the, the dark side of, uh, veterinary medicine, um, uh, in Lethbridge, Alberta. And I've been there ever since it's, it's really, uh, it's caught a hold of me. I I'm quite passionate about it and really enjoy the work and the clients I get to uh, work with and even switching from loving sheep maybe first to actually love and pigs. Very good. Okay. And, um, and so, but before we do, you have an interesting pastime that I <laughs> actually think is relevant to the topic today. Because it explains a little bit of how you came up with the idea. And so Cordell today is going to talk to us about checklists and their application in swine medicine. And he, I'll, I'll let him tell a story of how his hobby helped him to come up with the idea of the importance and value of checklists. Yeah, sure. So this is uh, quite a quite a passion of mine as well as pigs is, is flying uh, and aviation in general. Um, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. And so obviously through high school and vet school, it's busy enough that it's hard to get out to the airport to, uh, to train. Um, and it took me a couple of years into practice, uh, probably two years ago, two and a half years ago, I, I finally said enough of this, I got to go flying and I got to get my pilot's license. And so, uh, over the summer of that year and, and it took me about a year actually to complete all the hours for my, my private pilot's license. 
um, I've really come to enjoy and, and love aviation, actually. Um, even though we live in Lethbridge, which is notoriously uh, 80 knots or more straight out of the West, there are days that we can fly. Um, and uh, <laughs> in general, one of the key features of, of aviation is actually the checklist. Um, and I'll, I'll reference a book probably several times as we chat, The, the Checklist Manifesto. Um, it's by uh, Atul Gawande. He's a surgeon uh, from the U.S. And he was, he was exploring the connections between medicine and aviation. And he went back to the checklist, actually. Um, and, and I'm not sure if I could take a few minutes to go into the background. It, it was way back in the, uh, in the mid-1900s, actually. There was uh, Boeing uh, had invented and, and made and brought to manufacturing the B-299 bomber. Um, and they were wanting to get the, the contract for the U.S. government uh, Air Force uh, to build these planes and have that in the Army. Um, but uh, tragically, as, as they were showing off the first model with their most talented pilot, um, something malfunctioned and the plane crashed and uh, the, it, was, it was a fatal crash, unfortunately. And, and Boeing said, this is a complex machine. And yes, it, in, it, it requires intelligent people, but even our most intelligent person was not able to fly it without a mistake. And that's the birthplace of the checklist as we know it in aviation today. And as I, as I go to run up, I start, I start the plane, I do my run up. As I'm taxiing down to the runway, I've usually done about seven checklists already. And they're, they're point for point for point. Um, simple, for, for example, uh, on the run up, brakes are set, makes are full rich. Fuel pump is on, fuel selectors to the fullest tank, uh, the throttles to 2,000. You just go step, 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 step. And by the time you're done, you know that it was done correctly. And when you do the checklist every time, you know that when I'm taken off the runway, everything has been done right. And so thinking about that mindset of what the checklist accomplishes, um, we're we're able to apply this to, to the pig industry. I'm confident we can apply it anywhere that we deal with, as, as uh, a tool mentions in the, uh, in the book, the problem of extreme complexity, where there are many things happening at a certain time, many inputs, many outputs, many processes and systems in the, in, in the mix, which I think describes a pig bar. <laughs> um, and, and so it just resounds to me in my practice, but also for producers in their barns, there is utility uh, for a well-done checklist. Yeah, I, I find the concept really, really interesting, Cordell. And as I think of the circumstances for somebody working in a hog barn um, or other parts of the industry, but certainly working in a hog barn, when you go in to the barn in the morning, you have in your mind an idea of what your chores are, what you need to get done that day, and how you're going to do them. But inevitably, at some point on many days, something distracts you. You know, there's a broken water line. There's a, a pig that is in dire condition. Um, there's uh, fuses have blown. There's equipment's not working. And you have your regular chores to do, but you have these these distractions that come up that have to be attended to and frequently have to be attended to right away, which would make it very easy to miss something that would be on your checklist. So I, I think it makes a lot of sense when, when I was reading about your, your concept here. Absolutely. So are, are you, are you the, are you the only so far veterinarian that's using checklists or are other others that are using the concept or with their clients as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, other, I know for a fact, other systems, um, likely in integrators, other uh, producers and people will be using checklists. If if not checklists, they will have a binder somewhere full of SOPs, which are a, a close relative, I would say, to a checklist. Right. 
Um, and and part of part of my pursuit actually in in learning more about checklists and becoming passionate about them is that they don't become just a dead protocol or they don't become a paper in the binder that's dusty on the shelf um, because that's not utility day to day. And that doesn't account for just like you said, I love that actually about the distractions that inevitably come, right? Um, jump, jumping back to the book and, and it ties in, I, I think it's just a nice segue into the health aspect uh, was a study that the author referenced from one of the hospitals on placing central line. And what they, um, what they had uh, was 11% of procedures that had infections uh, with the central line being placed at the university that they were doing the study from. And they made, a, they made a checklist. That checklist was that the doctor would wash his, hand, his or her hands with soap, clean the patient's skin with antiseptic, use sterile drapes, wear new gloves, a mask, and a, and a hat. And the fifth was apply the sterile dressing over the insertion site. These are all things that are not complicated and you would almost expect. Yet, in about a third of the cases, at least one of those things was forgotten. Really? And hence, they had like 11%. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, they did this over an 18-month period. They, they had the historical, then an 18-month period of just, I think they had an assistant. It, it wasn't a uh, needed, they didn't need to have a highly paid professional reading off the checklist. And they had this person assisting to make sure that the checklist was done. Infections fell to functional 0%. Wow. So yep. they, yep. In, in that 18 month period, I think they had two cases over 18 months um, during the, the study period. And so I think that it just illustrates the point that you had made really that we aren't trying to reinvent the wheel. We aren't trying to come up with the next best uh, artificial intelligence solution here. Um, we're just trying to make sure we're accurate and consistent and that we get it right. You bet. And, and that we're, I know we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves and I'm going to go back in, in a minute, but it just seems. Sure. Yeah. At this point, <laughs> as you talk about the uh, reduction in infections due to the use of a checklist under relatively simple conditions, uh, procedures, is it possible within the big barn and, and, and have you seen this in your experience that by following a checklist, the number of these distractions that happen, these, these um, uh, urgencies that come up with broken water lines, heaters that aren't working, fans that aren't working, et cetera, et cetera, uh, can be reduced so that when you do go into the barn in the morning, you have less of these distractions and these other somewhat time-consuming tasks that have to be completed in addition to your normal chores. Yeah, you know, it's hard to... I'll give a soft answer of the the producers that are following this are more organized. So mm -hmm. we wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily have have data as as good as what the hospital or what the hospitals would have where they they're charting all of this. But you know what? We we've seen uh for for example in in um where there the cases where there might be yeah challenges in a nursery let's say with with uh, sudden deaths or just um, challenges that relate to environment let's say <laughs> whether that be um, the air quality for some reason just isn't isn't consistent or feed delivery it has hiccups um, water nipples plug that type of thing. These are simple things that contribute to the mortality of a barn. And often I, as a, a vet, come in and way, go way over the heads of simple management and look into diseases and what's the breakdown of the, these mortalities. And yet these simple things may be missed. And in cases where the, the staff have started to be, become just more organized in that sense of thinking in the way of a checklist, 
that that is seen, that is felt. Uh, I I couldn't give you hard numbers, a, a percent or two on nursery mortality type of thing. Um, there's definitely on the ground impact. And I guess an even softer answer <laughs> to that is the staff being more organized in the sense that they can then focus on health um, or their their time isn't so busy doing regular daily things that they can actually look at the pigs, you know? Right. Um, yep. And yeah, that's that's kind of the, the concept, I guess. Yeah, I was thinking as you were speaking that one, maybe one example could be that uh, uh, certainly in, in Western Canada, um, all your barns, or certainly most of the barns, all the barns that I saw when I was living in Canada were all power ventilated and therefore all had air inlets. And one of the things that we knew f- almost for certain that if you wanted to have problems with tail biting, you did not make sure that the air inlets were properly adjusted. And so, uh, cause you have some inlets that are open two inches and others that are open one inch and others that aren't open at all. And maybe even have one that's open four inches and you have this disparate flow of air and you have drafts. And I know one producer told me he could turn tail biting on and off just by how he adjusted his, his air inlets. And so that is something that will be on a checklist when you empty out the barn and you clean it up and you're preparing it for the next fill is to make sure all those inlets are equally adjusted. And that could then reduce the amount of time that you spend dealing with tail biting. Absolutely. And you know what? That is probably in, in terms of uh, rubber hitting the road, practical things that can be done today or tomorrow or this week yeah. for producers. Yes. yes. That's exactly what we're talking about. And and you've already hit on it in, in terms of the swine industry. And, and right in the barns, I think that's probably the, the most overlooked is room preparation, right? It, it just, it just gets overlooked. Yeah. We, we, in, in a, in a nursery room, uh, you move out the last group, you wash, you disinfect. Great. And then you open the door a couple of days later and in come a bunch of new pigs. But where, where are op- our opportunities for, let's say, a pre-fill checklist? That's the, the, probably the most uh, concrete example or, or impactful example that I could mention today, I, I think. Um, okay, you set all the inlets to 0% and adjust them and calibrate them. Can you imagine if that was done every time? Empty out the water lines so that they're at least dry or run a disinfect through those water lines. Mm-hmm. And make sure yeah. that they're rinsed. Ah, yes. Right? Yes. So that the water lines are fresh and clean. Right. Um, empty out the, or if, if the if the uh, feeders are bowl enough that there's water and disinfect left in them, that needs to be emptied. Because if a pig drinks that first thing when they come in the pen, they are going to be so ticked off that they're not going to eat for a little while. Maybe a day, maybe two because it tasted so bad, right? So, okay, the disinfect is gone. But I mean, even jumping back to, um, was a degreaser applied? So make sure that, okay, it was degreased before it was disinfected. And then make sure that it was dried. I mean, this is very, it's very basic stuff. I'm not coming up with new science at all, but it's just the application in a simple way that, okay, the animals are moved out. You, you degrease it, you disinfect it, you dry it, you set the inlets, you clean the, the water lines, you empty the feed troughs, you fill the feed troughs with fresh feed less than a day before the animals come in, right? So that it's fresh and they like it. You set up the gruels if you, if you need to. Um, you um, even plan out the, the stocking of the pens if you need to, of how many needs to go in each, in each pen type of thing um each each of those things setting water nipple height if that's applicable all of these things on a checklist you can have a five or six point thing that takes less than a minute to do and you've changed the experience of that pig absolutely cordell and and then it leads to me interestingly um 
as we have, we don't have a lot of producers, but we're having more and more producers that are looking at going down the path of antibiotic free, um, or re, uh, no antibiotic ever kind of production systems. And I did a, I did a review paper on that, uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago. And what struck me, I looked at all the feed additives that might be used. I looked at how the diet formulations might change in antibiotic free production. But what really struck me is that there had to be this constituent of attention to the pig to minimize stress on it because you no longer can depend on the antibiotic to overcome that. And amazingly, when producers are doing that, they, they are finding they're achieving not the same production as with antibiotics, but they're finding they're achieving a quite impressive uh, performance in their pigs. But everything has to be attended to because it's the old, I mean, uh, this one goes back in time immemorial, uh, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And a pig's success is only as, as successful as the lowest level of lowest uh, level management practice in that barn, whether it was adjustment of the inlets or whether it was using a degreaser or whether it was pre-warming the room before the new pigs came in, et cetera, et cetera. Anyhow, I'm talking way too much. I want to listen to you instead. No, no, that's, but you're, you're spot on. You're spot on. Can we go back then, Cordell, and for the benefit of our listeners, if they are a pork producer and they say, you know, I think this makes a lot of sense for a number of reasons to have these checklists, how do you go about implementing them? And then after we've talked about that a little bit, then I'd like to go to how do we go about maintaining them? So, you know, people are excited and they start and they use them, but then a month later, six months later, a year later, are they still using them? So at first off, how do you implement checklists with one of your clients? What's the procedures? Yeah, so it's not easy. I'll say that first, because we are an in industry that has been inundated with SOPs, standard operating procedures that we need to write them out. And we've Dare I say we've uh, created a disdain for SOPs. Um, <laughs> just, oh, an SOP? Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, and I think it leads to some of the key features that we need to look at. Okay, what is a good checklist? A good checklist is one that the staff or the people performing the duty want to use. And so there are many, many details that um, go into how we accomplish that. And the very first place we need to be careful is that it's not the management writing the checklist. It's the people doing the work that write the checklist. And I'll, I'll use an example from, from my own practice for that. And I probably went overboard on the details, but... When my, if I, if I need to send any staff out to a facility to either just pick up samples or do some type of task, um, I went, I, I actually sat down, uh, well, a couple months ago anyway, shortly after I had read the book and started taking it in and applying it to, uh, to my practice. Um, I sat down with, uh, with one of my staff and, and said, okay, what is every detail you need to know? going to a farm so that you feel comfortable that you you know the details you know what's going to happen you know what's expected of you and there's no surprises and so we came out with a list okay i need to provide a little checklist mine has about 20 things on it which is drastically too long um but it included the name of the farm the name of the person that he needed to talk to the phone number of that person, the, did I say the location of the farm and GPS coordinates, the biosecurity considerations, when he gets there, where does he need to park? What does, what does he need to do in terms of biosecurity before he even gets there so that he hasn't been a breach? Um, once he gets there, what is it, what's the history? What's the reason he's going? And so we went through all of these details 
And it takes me about three minutes to finish that checklist and send it to the, the staff that would be doing the task because they made it for me. He told me things that my, my one staff member told me things that I didn't even think of that changed the checklist, right? So that I think is the key feature. Um, but I got another couple of details on, on what makes a good versus a bad checklist. And one of them is long points that try and teach the user how to do their job. That is an absolute fail. And if we go back to the aviation checklist, pilots are smart people. Well, most pilots are. I don't know where I stand, but um, most, of, most of them are smart people. And the checklist is not designed to teach them how to fly. They know how to fly. The checklist is there as a, as a, as a reminder, right? Um, so another key feature of good versus bad checklists are vague, vague points. One of those could be there's feed in uh, there's feed in the feeders on a on a pre fill checklist. Well, you know what? A staff member that really doesn't want to be there, if there is a single pellet in the bottom of that feeder, they can truthfully check off that there's feed in that feeder. <laughs> but it has to be precise. The feed in that feeder is up to the level of the dropper. Great. There's no ambiguity there, right? And so that that becomes a critical piece is that there's no room for misinterpretation because as soon as there is, the checklist will get thrown aside because it makes people feel uncomfortable, right? Um, so that's a, a very, the it needs to be precise and yet simple to accomplish the task and be used. I think in terms of actually implementing checklists in barns that are um, useful and efficient, we have to get creative of, of where they are, the, the font that we use, the color of the card. Um, one example that I was thinking about recently is simply syringe cleaning after vaccination. Well, truthfully, the best place to store syringes is in a dry, sealed container. And so it would be very practical to have a checklist with each of the things. Okay, you've dismantled the parts that need dismantled. You've washed with a light soap if you did, and then a proper rinse if that's in the protocol, and then placed in the box. And that all sits on the lid of the container for the, uh, the sealed container, right? So the staff know that it needs to go in there, but as they put it in there, they, they're able, it's right there for them. They don't have to go looking for it and they don't have an, a, a deck of cards with checklists in their pocket. <laughs> that, those will never get used, right? <laughs> those are some of the things to, to consider in making a checklist. Don't make it too long. Five to nine points is what, uh, is, is what was recommended actually in the book that I, I referenced there. Five to nine points and no more. Because if it can't fit on there, it's not important enough. Okay. So um, just out of curiosity, when with the various checklists that you go through uh, as a pilot, uh, you mentioned, I forget, something like seven different checklists you went through before you got out to the runway. And how many items would be on each one of those checklists? Yeah, so actually, uh, there are seven. There is a checklist before starting. The engines, I'm just talking on the little Piper Warrior that I fly, um, which is not a sophisticated aircraft by any stretch. Um, before start, the engine start, before taxi, uh, as uh, taxiing down the runway, uh, doing the run-up, um, then before takeoff, and then after being cleared for takeoff. So... Some of those in the smaller airport that I fly from aren't applicable, like being cleared for takeoff because we're we're in a uh, class D airspace, right? So that isn't absolutely necessary. But number of um, so the engine checklist or the engine start. Oh, I just pulled up one here. So unfortunately, on the engine start, there is a seventeen point checklist, which is arguably too long. Um, but each of these, uh, each of the others, would be ten or less. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Just keeping it short. 
Yeah, those are, yeah, before we wrap this up, then uh, Cordell, can you help me at the next level? So you've introduced the checklist to your client and the client has adopted them. Uh, but then how do you, uh, the, the management of those in the longer term, what is it in your experience that are keys to success in maintaining the use? So it's one thing to get people excited about uh, adopting checklists. It's another thing to keep them using them six months from now or 12 months from now. So what are what do you think are some of the keys to achieving sec- success in maintaining a checklist? Right. That that brings up maybe maybe two points, actually. Um, but make, uh, one really in total, and that is frequent follow-up. This is where keeping it front of mind, um, as we, as we walk through the barns uh, multiple times a year for most clients, we are, we're able to see actually if checklists are being done based on the pig most of the time. Um, it, right, that that is usually given evidence based on just what the pigs look like, how many are on feed uh, after weaning. We'll, we've used that example. Um, un- unevenness, when we walk through the pens, how many of the water nipples are working. Um, and usually, usually there is a room in each of these pens. I'm, I'm just going to use this example of, of the pre-fill. But there's there's at least one room in most barns that is being washed during the visit, um, and that's that's the place I, I use that room to really educate myself about what's being done there. So I would say it's frequent follow up is very important, um, and understanding the jobs to be done of the of the uh, producer or or client um, because they. They have many things on their plate and, and different things come up. Maybe a, a different health challenge has hit them since we made the checklist and they, they have to do more to keep these pigs growing and, and on feed and stuff like that. So frequent follow-up is the short answer. Yep. Yep. But I think the best question is if they are using it, we ask, how can we make it better? And if they are not using it, we ask, why, if not, what is, what are your barriers? Right. And it, it, it gets to, I guess, another point on just staff turnover. We know that labor is so difficult, uh, in the swine industry as a whole. Um, and yes, we're seeing technology come in, which is great, uh, to, to help with the labor shortage and challenges there. But realistically in some barns we're looking at a hundred percent replacement in a year and so a lot of the follow-up on these checklists is is actually just reintroducing them to new staff and it with with the new staff that that i've mentioned and worked with on this it's been fairly well received because it helps them from a point of not maybe understanding everything that's required of them to having absolute clarity. And so I I think, yeah, sometimes checklists can be, you grow out of a checklist perhaps. Like if I'm doing this job for 15, 20 years, you know what, it's pretty pretty hard to get uh, or to convince me that I need to check the water feed in the air in in a grow finish pen. Uh, I'm going to be doing that anyway, right? But... um, so sometimes, yeah, you can outgrow maybe checklists perhaps, but the key is to revisit it and understand, okay, if it didn't work, why didn't it work? Was there something systemic here that got in the way? Or if we feel like we outgrew it, how can we actually build a better checklist that helps you accomplish even more and more efficiently? There's, I, I'm convinced there's always room to grow. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. If you're not trying to get better, then you're probably sliding backwards, right? So you kind of always within within reason seek to to do better. So I'm afraid our time is running out, Cordell. But by way of uh, sort of wrapping this up, are there one or two or three key messages 
that you would like to share with our listeners today uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the value of the development of the implementation or the maintenance of checklists in hog barns? Yeah, I think, I, I think just to yeah, kind of summarize, the key goal for all of us is we want to get it right. We want to have that. We want to be accurate. We want to be correct. And we want to be consistent. But often that consistency is where we fail uh, the most, right? And so if, if there was a starting point, maybe, is to sit down and actually just take 10 minutes. That can be all it takes at some points. But it must be with the people completing the checklist to gain traction. That If there was one message, that is it. Um, and then for, for continuing it, it, that can be built into performance, uh, performance reviews or regular barn visits to just revisit, okay, how are we doing with consistency of care for, for our pigs? And, and that's the ultimate goal, right? Very good. You bet. Makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of practical things in there, Cordell. And I want to thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've been quite fascinated by this, the, the ideas and concepts that you've shared with us and really how you came across the idea of developing these, these checklists. So uh, I think that's the, that's the exact kind of thing we like to see on, on Swine It Canada uh, in, these, uh, in these podcasts. So thank you very much. I've been speaking with Dr. Cordell Young, who is with Precision Veterinary Services in Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, and uh, I'm John Patience, the host, and thank you very much for listening today.